Amanda mentioned that uh, I'm very involved in gardening at Wakeman Town Farm in Westport. And if you haven't, uh, we're opening back up, I'm happy to say. So uh, go to wakemantownfarm.org and check out some of our programs. And we are also continuing to do a robust number of programs via Zoom for those of us who are at, at home and interested in learning more about uh, culinary and gardening topics, as well as other sustainability topics. So check it out. And uh, uh, I'm also talking with you today on behalf of the Pollinator Pathway. And I believe that uh, Dar Darianne has a very robust Pollinator Pathway. In fact, Darianne was the model for us in Westport to launch uh, Westport's Pollinator Pathway and, and uh, Wakeman Town Farm together with Earth Place uh, in Westport and the Westport Garden Club joined together to launch our own Pollinator Pathway. But as I said, Darianne was an early model for us and an inspiration in how it's done. So uh, today the talk is based on how to have a greener uh, landscape in your own backyard, how to begin, where to get started. So I am going to start sharing my screen so I can take you through the slides. And if you have questions as I go through it, if you have a, a, a burning question that you kind of like to get cleared up right away, uh, be sure to put it in chat so that Amanda spots it and lets me know that uh, you've got a question you'd like to have an answer to. And I will also be staying on. The talk is going to take about 50 minutes and I'll stay on uh, af at the end. Happy to answer as, as many questions as you have. So um, let me now turn, uh, turn on my, my share screen and we can get started. I know that if, if you guys are anything like me, you've got a really bad case of spring fever about now. And last week was a tease and this week it's cold again. And here you are with that garden niche. So the great thing is there's a lot you can be doing right now to get ready. And uh, that's what this talk is gonna be about today. So, there is no better time than right now to make a better garden. And uh, as I was uh, speaking about the pollinator pathway and uh, the purpose of the pollinator pathway is to provide, uh, to, to encourage homeowners to create habitats in their own backyard to help uh, replace the habitat that has being lost uh, in our shrinking, uh, shrinking open spaces. And uh, uh, the, the premise of the pollinator pathway is that you plant natives and you refrain from pesticides. And uh, this, uh, this talk today is about getting started in the garden. And I'm going to be looking at it from the point of view of subscribing to the principles of the pollinator pathway. So here we go. Why do we care about the pollinator pathway? I'm gonna just give you a few uh, talking points about this so that you understand where we're coming from and why it's so important to do it right now. Our pollinators are in terrible trouble. And I think you may have seen the New York Times Magazine cover story on the insect apocalypse, or perhaps you saw National Geographic. You'll miss them when they're gone. And it's about the importance of insects uh, and the role they play in our ecosystem for all living creatures, including us. And the fact that the populations have been crashing, especially since the 70s, we're seeing declines of 30% or more bird species as well. And this is putting our whole food web at risk. So pollinators contribute to about a third of the food we eat is uh, made fruitful and made possible by the work that pollinators do. 
And they aren't all honeybees, which are domesticated creatures doing that work. We have a lot of native bees. There are about 300 species of native bees in Connecticut alone. And we're losing them at a rapid clip because of loss of habitat, development, loss of open space, pesticide usage, and climate change. So the native species are vital to protect. And this is how we can help and how you can help in your garden. So our yards can replace that lost habitat. Uh, Doug Tallamy, um, who uh, is all about bringing nature home to your backyard has pointed out that 85% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. So yes, there's 15% of the land that's left in open spaces, but they're not connected to each other. So the idea of a pathway, our green corridor is to create many habitats all along the way so that uh, uh, the, the creatures in our ecosystem can find food and that they can safely travel from point A to point B. So as, as, uh, as we give up spraying chemicals on our lawns and create more uh, native, add more native species and, and uh, remove exotic species that don't sustain our, our native creatures, we are creating the kind of habitat that these creatures need. We are the stewards of the land our ecosystem depends on. So if you have, in effect, a food desert in your yard because it's a big expanse of lawn uh, with hardly any trees, bushes, and flowers, you are, are adding to the problem. And if you're taking a look at your yard now and asking yourself, what can I do? you've come to the right place. So you've heard me mention natives and you've said to yourself, well, gosh, does this mean I have to, if I don't have any natives in my yard right now, uh, do I have to replant the whole thing? Or if I have some non-natives? No, I am not here today to say, get rid of all your non-natives, not at all. But there's a really critical number that uh, Doug Tallamy in his research has found in terms of the balance between natives and non-natives. And this is something that we can actually strive for. So he says uh, that he's found that the key threshold is 70%. And what that means is it's okay to have 30% of your yard in non-native species, but try to have 70% in native species. And he found that say he, he looked at a population of chickadees in two neighborhoods, one that had not very many natives and one that did. And he found that the chickadees who rely on caterpillars, uh, larvae to feed their young, couldn't find enough larvae if they were in um, a neighborhood with mostly non-native trees because the non-native trees don't harbor uh, native uh, insects and uh, because they haven't evolved together. So what they found was the, the chickadees weren't finding enough food to feed their young in the non-native neighborhoods. And when the balance of natives approached 70%, then the chickadees were able to find enough insects to feed their young. So that's a really key thing to know. They found a heartbreaking thing, which was in the neighborhoods that didn't have enough native species, they found chickadees trying to feed their young with seed from bird feeders. Baby birds can't eat seed. They, they can eat larvae, they can eat soft things, and they can eat protein-rich caterpillars, but they can't eat bird seed. So 70% um, is the goal. Now, let's see how we get there. If you're thinking about things to plant in your yard, I want you to know about what's called keystone natives. Well, this is a big chart and please don't rush and take notes on this because Amanda's gonna send you a handout afterward that has this information in it. So just understand this chart shows you how many species just of butterflies and moths alone, let alone other insects such as bees and so forth, are, are sustained by these particular plants. 
So if you're going shopping for a tree, a shrub or a flower, look at this list and say to yourself, where could I add a maple? Where could I add an oak? Because those are the ones that are gonna pack a punch in your yard in terms of biomass. And when I say biomass, I mean one big tree can harbor a whole lot more insects, which is food for the birds, than one little flower can. So think in terms of scale and mass and if you have a giant oak tree in your yard, you are doing a great job of providing biomass, native biomass for, for the birds and the insects. So that's something to keep in mind. That's what this list is about. Okay, so these are some desirable plants. Now, that means you can have a beautiful yard and a great habitat. And the way to do it is starting here. Now, I know we all want to go shopping in the nursery and bring home beautiful plants. Many a time, I've fallen prey to this urge, but you're gonna end up with driveway plants, plants sitting in your driveway waiting for you to get something ready, or you don't know where to put them, you haven't decided where to put them, you just bought them because you're pretty, because they're pretty. That's not the way to start. The way to start is this. What kind of yard do you want? It's really important to have your goals in mind when you are planning to make changes in your garden or in your yard. So start with your objectives. Is it more light? I mean, prettier views. What do you look at outside your window? More flowers, less maintenance. Let's be realistic. That can be a goal too more privacy, more veggies to enjoy, more curb appeal, more color. Sit down and figure out what is it you really want to attack. When you prioritize your goals, now it's time to take the view from 30,000 feet, so to speak. What do you have now? You can take a virtual tour sitting right at your computer with the help of Google Earth to get a sense of the big picture. And conveniently, Google seems to have taken their pictures during the summer. So uh, check it out. So this is an actual property, a bird's eye view. And um, interestingly, this lot has a lot of established native trees. So let's say this is your yard. You can see how much tree cover you have, how much light you have. Um, and you can um, take a physical tour of the property and using uh, going back and, and identifying the keepers and the losers as you walk around your yard. Try to assess how much of your yard has native plantings. Make a note of what's doing well and what seems to just be struggling and uh, where you have sunlight and where you don't. We are almost at the equinox, March 21st. This is a great idea to gauge the sunlight in your yard because you get, this is exactly the midpoint. And from here on in, which is going to be the growing season, from here on in to uh, September 21st, the next equinox, the days are gonna get longer and longer. So a lot of what we figure out and what will grow in our garden is based on how many hours of sunlight. So make a note now of where the shadows fall in your yard and you will have a good sense of the average sunlight for your yard. Okay, so say you took this bird's eye view and took a screen grab of it. And then you went through and said, well, I know this big oak is a native and so is this little oak and so is this dogwood. Um, see the big, the big circles are the big, big biomass, uh, the tall trees, there's uh, maples and uh, oaks, uh, sugar, there's red maples, sugar maples um, and dogwoods. In the and those are the green circles and the red circles are the non-natives and the bushes. 
So is this yard doing a job of having 70% native? You bet. And those big tall oaks are doing a lot of the work of creating that. Uh, and the red circles kind of show, show some zones where maybe some work needs to be done. In this particular yard, uh, the, there's a lot of burning bush and that's a problem because it's an invasive non-native and it's spreading into open spaces and out competing native plants. So in this yard, most of those red circles represent burning bush that has got to go. Maybe not, not all in a season, that would be a big undertaking, but that is on the hit list. So you probably are still not entirely sure of everything in your yard. And that's understandable because unless you uh, become a master gardener, it's hard to recognize everything, especially when it doesn't have leaves on it. So um, as you were taking your tour, you probably identified a tree or two that looks like it's not doing too well. Uh, there have been some, uh, some people still have ashes on their property and the green, uh, the emerald green ash borer, which is an exotic insect that was, uh, that came in on some non-natives and has devastated our ash population. That's something that's going to have to come out because there's no saving it. So bring an arborist into your yard, ask them to take care of that tree that's in bad shape and ask for an ID on mystery trees too. So then you can say, oh, uh, a ginkgo? Hmm, is that native? Google it, not native. Uh, so uh, make notes. And uh, there's also some great apps out there. Uh, iNaturalist.org and Picture This are both apps that you can actually point at something and it'll help identify it. That's good for when they've got their leaves back on, which won't be too long. A third week in April, we usually start seeing leaves back on the trees. You can ask a knowledgeable friend or a master gardener to uh, uh, walk through your property and, and identify some of your mystery stuff. And uh, there's a really good bar book called uh, Bark that I bet you is at the library. And uh, it's a field guide to trees of the Northeast that you can tell just from their bark what trees you've got, which is very useful if you don't want to wait until the leaves are back. So those are all good resources for identifying what's in your yard. And uh, once you've identified it, it's easy to tell if it's a native or not because uh, that, that information is readily available on the internet. So now, what's the thing you do next? Get rid of the glaring problem first. I call it ripping off the Band-Aid. So if you have, if you can see that there's some invasive vines that are climbing up your trees and choking them, time to uh, get rid of them. Uh, uh, overgrown shrubs, if uh, something has grown up so high, it's blocking your window, uh, growing into another shrub, make a call. Maybe one of them isn't worth saving. You get rid of that and give the other one a chance to have its proper shape. Those are the kind of things you can do right now. Pruning time, uh, you can prune most things in March. It's a really good time to prune because they're still in dormancy and uh, uh, you prune them now, it's easier for the plant to heal and then pruning actually stimulates growth and you'll get a nice flush of growth in the shape that of the plant that you like. So uh, the only exception is if you have a uh, shrub um, that is, or tree or small tree that is blooms in the spring, don't prune that now. That you wait till after the prune to prune, bloom to prune, or you'll lose this season's flowering. So uh, if you've got a lilac or something, you don't prune it now. If you've got an azalea, you don't prune it now. Uh, they are going to bloom um, and then you can prune them afterward. Okay, hazardous dying trees. By all means, take the tree, but leave the snag. So this is what's called a snag. This is an oak tree that died a while back on my property and I had, it's far from the house. I don't have to worry about it crashing down on the house and I removed the side limbs for safety, but I left the tree up because a snag, and I think it's kind of cool looking. I love the, the bleached color of the wood 
And I especially love hearing all the happy woodpeckers working away at that. Uh, it's, got, it's got lots of insects chewing on it and it's got lots of food for the birds and even nesting cavities. So um, that's my snag. So as you're uh, taking down trees, leave a little bit of snag. This is a tall snag, doesn't have to be that big, but leaving a little behind, and especially if you've got a woody strip on the edge of your property, this is a really good thing to do for the birds and the bugs. If uh, boxwood blight has struck your block boxwoods, and by the way, they're not a native. I know that they're a very useful uh, shrub and a lot of people have them in their property, but there's a blight um, that is fatal to the boxwoods. And uh, if they're turning brown, um, just uh, uh, bite the bullet and uh, take them out and replace them with a nice native shrub. <clears throat> Another thing that's a glaring problem sometimes is the wrong plant in the wrong place. Something got planted. Uh, we have, there are sp uh, spruce. A lot of landscapers, when they're um, putting up new homes, plant spruces, and these are sun-loving trees, and they, but they're fast growing, so the landscaper puts them in close to the house to, uh, uh, so the house will look good when it goes up for sale, but they quickly overgrow their spot. And if they're not getting enough light, they get scraggly. They are usually the non-natives that, that they have this problem with. And uh, the, in a case like that, you might say, well, that tree is just in the wrong place. It's got to come out. Same time, sometimes if you have uh, a, uh, uh, if you planted, say, a coneflower in the shade and the darn thing never flowers, well, that's because it's a, it's a, it likes sun. So move it to a sunnier spot and uh, uh, it'll be happier. Another thing to look out for that you want to just plain get rid of now is barberries. Those are the bushes that have the thorns on them. And uh, uh, University of Connecticut did a study and discovered their tick habitat. And uh, the, the mice that are a vector for ticks love to hide under barberries. In, they, they hide from their predators under the thorns and they eat the berries. And so in areas where barberries are grown, there's a higher concentration of ticks. So get rid of the barberries. We did that in our yard a number of years ago. Uh, and I have not found a tick on myself or of my husband since we did that. So, and we don't spray in our yard. So that's something to uh, uh, get right on. Another thing to get right on while they're still small is volunteer invasive saplings. So a lot of times saplings invite themselves and they're growing too close to an established tree. So get those, uh, get, cut them down while they're small and it's a lot cheaper to do it then than waiting till they're tall. Okay. Alice, yes. Speaking of um, removing things that shouldn't be there, when do you think would be the best time to remove poison ivy? Oh, what a good question. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to mention uh, while you're looking at the trees in your yard, if you see a vine climbing up the tree that is attached to the tree with hairy rootlets, you can see that that's what, and, and it doesn't have any leaves on it, that is poison ivy. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, you can um, cut it, go down to the base of the tree and just cut it, just completely cut it. Um, and you can do that without risking um, trying to rip the whole vine off the tree because if you completely cut it, that'll be the end of that vine. Now, in terms of poison ivy, what I do is uh, I, I pull it when I see it. So um, it, uh, and I suit up and I put my uh, gloves on and everything else, and then uh, uh, throw, uh, peel everything off afterwards and, and throw it in the wash. But you can remove it at any time because all parts of the poison ivy plant are equally uh, irritating. So the main thing is to just suit up and protect yourself and just get it out whenever you see it. Uh, but certainly before the time it has chance to set fruit because the birds do love the fruit on, po on poison ivy berries and they are going to help spread it. So if you're, uh, my husband is terribly allergic to poison ivy and I just basically, my rule is suit up and rip it out as soon as I spot it. 
that helps. Um, okay, so um, now we're gonna talk about what will grow in your yard and that is knowing the factors that you have in your yard and the key ones are soil, light, moisture, time, the hardiness zone and deer pressure. I'm gonna take each of them in turn. So the soil factor, test your soil in the area you will be planting. And I'm gonna tell you a really easy way to know what to do to test your soil is I made a very short video and it's on wakemantownfarm.org um, how to's. And so just look that up and you can see my short video. It's a couple minutes long on how you take a soil sample and send it off to the lab at UConn. And, um, and then you amend it as direction. They will give you uh, instructions. You tell them what, kind, what, what you wanna grow and they'll tell you what to do to amend the soil if you need to. So that's the first step. The next step is the light factor. And uh, sunlight can't be faked. Uh, you, can, you can make your soil more fertile, but if your sunlight is lacking, then you have some choices to make. Find a spot in your yard. Maybe it's just your deck. Maybe your pollinator garden is gonna be on your deck in containers. That's okay too. Uh, but you need to gauge whether you have enough sun to grow the things you want to grow. Full sun plants means six hours of sun, and I don't mean starting at seven in the morning. So if you had six hours of sun starting at seven in the morning, it probably still would, that's just morning sun, wouldn't be enough. Uh, so you need uh, the hours of sun between 10 and four are the strongest. There's an app you can try called Sunseeker. There's another one called Find My Shadow. They will help you gauge how many hours of sunlight you're gonna have in the spot you're looking at putting it, or you could just use your eyeballs and kind of track when the shadows, uh, when the shade hits it, okay? And you might, um, might uh, want to thin out that unwanted non-native tree uh, to create a little bit more light to, for growing your garden. The moisture factor. Now, especially when it comes to natives, most natives have needs that are in sync with our climate. So that means that they aren't going to need as much water as an exotic or something that came from say a boggy area or something like that. So uh, just know that nearly every plant requires extra water to get established. So be prepared when you put new plants in to water them until they get established. And that means kind of babying them for the first growing season and keeping an eye on how much uh, rainfall we're actually getting. Rain gauges are really inexpensive. They're just, you know, basically a tube with marks on it. And what we need around here, our average rainfall in the summer here in Connecticut is supposed to be an inch a week. That said, we can have a droughty month like we did last June. It hardly rained the whole month of June, which is kind of a shock. And uh, so then the job is to, re to make up for the rain that didn't fall by watering your plants. Uh, if you're growing veggies, they need supplemental water to grow versus other plants. So regular babying is, is required for veggies. But ideally your flower garden should not need regular irrigation to prosper. And in fact, a lot of flowers are really better off if their leaves aren't wet all the time. So don't have, if you have irrigation, don't have that daily sprinkler hitting your flowers. Try to fix that zone so they're not hitting your flowers. Sunny open areas in sandy soil, and especially if they have a slope, are gonna need more water. Shaded, sheltered, low-lying areas need less water. That's a given. Intermittently wet areas like downspots, downspouts, uh, need adaptable plants. And uh, so it's a matter of knowing what a plant uh, will tolerate. If you've got a plant that is happy in either moist or average soil, that's a good one for a downspout area because it means when it gets inundated occasionally, it, it, it'll be fine with that. If you have soaker or drip hoses, that beats spray overhead spraying. So check out your irrigation system. 
you don't want overhead spraying on a flower garden. It just uh, spoils the blossoms faster. Soil that's rich in organic matter will has the capacity to hold more water and uh, doesn't need watering as frequently. Uh, if there's an extended drought, and if you've been keeping an eye on the amount of rainfall we have, you know if it hasn't rained in two weeks, certain things, uh, many things are going to start to need some assistance. The time factor. There's two kinds of time here. Um, be, be patient. Great gardens are born in years, not weeks. So uh, some of your plantings are gonna need time to fill in before they look their greatest. Perennials, they always say, kind of sleep the first year, they creep the second year, and then they leap the third year. So perennials being plants that come back every year, you gotta give them a little patience, give them a little room when you first plant them, they're gonna fill out. Low maintenance exists, but not no maintenance. Uh, if you just don't have any time, but you want to do your bit, I call it, uh, if usually, uh, I mean, some folks have more uh, money than time. Checkbook gardening is perfectly okay. Uh, bring in some help um, or keep it small. Smaller gardeners are, are easier to maintain and they give plenty of joy, even containers. Shrubs and grasses provide ample benefits with little care, and a lot of them are pretty deer resistant. Strategically placed containers can make magic on a small scale. Um, here in the lower corner, I have an example that's viburnum, that's um, uh, choke barrier or aronia, and that's a something called a little blue stem, a really pretty grass. These are the kinds of things that you could look at growing if uh, you don't have much time and you want to have uh, some natives in your garden. The hardiness factor. Most of you will, if you plug in your zip code, uh, it will tell you your zone by zip code. Uh, we are in an interesting area here uh, on co in coastal Connecticut where uh, the latest zones say that you're in zone seven. However, I'm closer to the merit and uh, my garden acts more like zone six. And uh, to, to the point that uh, people say that uh, west of the merit, you get snow and, and uh, east of the merit, closer to the shoreline, you get rain. So that shows a kind of dividing line. So um, there's a range. Microclimates matter too. So if you've got a south facing spot close to the house, you may be able to get away with uh, growing something that's only hardy to zone seven or even sometimes zone eight. I have a friend who found out she could keep her, her elephant ears, which are a zone eight plant, uh, growing because she has a very sheltered kind of a tucked away area facing south close to the house and she mulches them like crazy and they come back every year. But if you had them out in my garden, they would never survive. So, so you can push your luck a little bit and get to know your yard. Um, something else to keep in mind though is right now climate change is giving us more extremes. So as you pick plants, if you see a plant that has a range, say it's hardy from zone five to zone eight, then you know you're good. Some folks in Dallas got a shock because they are, uh, Dallas and Houston are zone eight normally, but uh, when they got that terrible zero degree weather, all of a sudden it's like they're in zone six. Many people lost many plants out there because of that. So when you have a range of hardiness in the plants you choose, you're more protected against those extremes. The deer factor. I hate to say it, um, deer are a limiting factor to gardening and uh, we all wish they weren't, but it's best to know what you're up against. Uh, the pressure that they are creating on habitat is serious business and communities are going to have to deal with it. If you think about it, uh, they don't have predators, although coyotes and bobcats and things are coming back and uh, uh, that may help control their population in urban areas because otherwise it's cars and starvation and that is cruel too. So 
uh, hunting may be the kindest way to control their population, but a lot of people are worried about that. Um, just some things to think about. So fence strategically if you can. If no fence is possible, you've got to grow defensively. Deer resistant varieties, it's important to know what they are. I'm going to be giving you some suggestions today. And uh, protect new plants. Here's something to keep in mind. You might have looked up and saw that a plant was uh, rated as extremely deer resistant. Well, people joke that deer don't read and they're always willing to try something, especially when the plant is new to your yard. They come and they check it out. A lot of nurseries uh, pump plants up with uh, fertilizers uh, before they put them on, uh, you know, for, for, up for sale because they, uh, uh, the plant looks lush. Well, that lush new growth is what deer like to nibble on. So if you've got, a new shrub that you just planted and it's supposed to be deer resistant, be on the safe side and spray it with an organic uh, deer repellent when you first plant it. And that will help you uh, protect your plant for that first little trial nip and everything that, they, that the plant may get. And after a while, after it's gotten acclimated to the garden and that uh, new growth, fresh new growth has toughened up a little bit, they may be less likely to chew on it. So you've just given it some protection strategically. Um, as far as organic deterrent sprays go, uh, naturework.com uh, has a great uh, e-blast that they send out uh, to keep you on a spraying schedule. So if you didn't want to forget to spray your flowers with deer blast uh, or deer off or one of the organic repellents, uh, if you sign up for this e-blast, uh, not only does it have a lot of good garden tips, but they will all tell you it's been three weeks, go out and spray. So it's easy, easier to remember that way. So that's something you might want to check out, uh, whatever works. So those are the key factors. Having done your homework and done these assessment and chosen your goals, it's time to get to the planning your plantings. So plot your spot. Say you've decided to put in a new pollinator bed. Um, stake out your new area with twine or a hose works really well to define the contours if it's not a rectangle. Measure it and uh, get yourself some grid, grid paper. Uh, there's, there's a link included here. This will be in the handout so you can download a little worksheet to uh, make notes on. And, and really get to know the condi exact conditions of that spot as far as how much light it gets uh, and whether uh, it seems uh, moist or if you know it's a dry spot. Uh, calculate the square footage by adding up the squares. That's important to know for knowing how much compost you have to buy to spread, spread around, that kind of thing. So, so you've got your, your spot chosen. Now you're gonna prepare the stage. Site prep is really, really key. And a lot of us, because we're eager to get gardening, have a tendency to uh, gloss over this. Don't do that, especially if you're converting lawn to garden. Uh, scalp it to remove existing turf, or you're gonna be pulling um, see grass out of your out of your garden forever uh, when you're weeding so this scalping to remove that top layer uh, turf grass has a shallow has a shallow root system so you can kind of get in under it with a shovel and scrape that very top layer off um, rototilling is not a great idea it breaks down the soil structure the soil structure is really important to healthy roots so don't do rototilling but you can loosen compacted soil using a, um, a fork, or there's something called a broad fork that has multiple tines so you can cover the ground faster. But usually if you just go through with a fork and sink those tines down in and, and kind of give, give it a wiggle to loosen that compacted soil, if people have been tromping all over it or um, it, it may be compacted. Get, get out any weeds that you seed and work in compost. Uh, an inch to two inch layer of compost, which is a lot you'll find when you start spreading it uh, and, and, wor and work that in with your fork. 
uh, a mentor soil, by that time, you, uh, you, while you've been doing your homework, hopefully your soil test uh, results came back and you'll take a look. And if it says that you're low in calcium or low in whatever, uh, you follow the directions, they tell you how much to add and you put that down. Um, do some removal, editing, dividing of existing plants as needed. If you've got, uh, say, a really nice, really, really happy uh, plant, but it's kind of outgrowing its space, divide it. Awfully easy to do. You dig the plant up and it's really good to do while the plant is still semi-dormant and uh, split it with a spade. And now you have two plants, free plants. What could be bad? Uh, and add mulch. A chopped leaves are really good mulch. Uh, if you're buying mulch, make sure that you do not buy the kind that has been tinted. It's, that stuff actually comes from China and has been tinted with a petroleum product and who needs chemicals in their garden? So exploring your plan options, and there are a whole lot of different great resources right now. Uh, first of all, Aspetuck Land Trust is having a fabulous spring native plant sale, and they even have uh, com uh, combinations uh, suggestions uh, for how to use them together, scout those sales use, there are wonderful online tools and books, and uh, it, part of your handout that Amanda's going to send you has uh, links to those things built into it. Um, we gardener, we don't steal ideas, we borrow them, and that is perfectly okay, and there are a lot of great ones out there. Uh, so look, copy, uh, look up uh, native plant designs, and uh, look for things uh, for the Northeast, and uh, take anything that, uh, that you like as an idea and use it. Screen for your limiting factors. You've identified what are potential problems in your lawn, maybe in your yard, perhaps not quite enough light, a uh, problem with deer. Keep that in mind. Don't get excited and fall in love with a plant that you can't have because it's going to be the wrong plant for your yard. And remember timing, you're looking for early, mid and late bloomers. And again, I'm gonna be giving you a couple good uh, suggestions for that. And remember scale, uh, some nice balance of short, medium and tall. Uh, remember to, that you're gonna want, if you've got, there are some wonderful natives that are on the tall side that bloom late in the year. So you wanna spot, find a spot for those where you'll have them at the back of your garden or in a spot where maybe you look out from a distance and you'd enjoy looking at them. Keep the color in mind and know the spacing the plants require. Uh, that information, they tell you how big the plant is going to be width-wise at full size. So if they say it's going to be four feet wide, so a shrub is going to be four feet wide, you know, don't plant that um, a foot away from another shrub. Give it room. You can always, if you, when you planted your shrubs and they haven't gotten big yet and you've got space in between them, you can always fill in with annuals or perennials that you can move later as the shrub starts to fill in. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. So here's a nice, and this is in your handout, so you don't have to write all this down, but these are suggested flowers for a full sun garden. And I've grouped them into early season. It's, it's good as you're making your notes of plants that you'd like to try, it's good to keep in mind, are they early, middle, or late? Because that will help you balance out so that you don't have gaps in your bloom sequence. And the reason that's important is because you want to, basically, you want a continuous season of bloom for beauty, and you also want a continuous season of bloom for our pollinators to always be able to find something in your garden. These are for a part sun, sun garden. So let's say you have uh, between four to six hours of sun in the hours between 10 and uh, four, um, some of these could do better there. And uh, these are also chosen for being not so beloved by deer. Uh, so this, this is a nice complement of plants and they look, they look pretty together and they have uh, different uh, personalities. And so these are, this is a good place to, um, uh, to work from as well as the, uh, the, the collections that you're gonna find online. 
So these are some great planning resources. Again, this is in your handout, so you, you can, and they've got live links in them, so you can go there and, and look them up. Uh, the, uh, this first one, Native Plants for the Small Yard, is great because it has little planting plans and it's all done with natives and uh, they aren't, uh, and, and they're for small gardens, so you could start small. And another great uh, source is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and you can uh, plug in your state and it'll give you recommended flowers by, uh, for your state with uh, care descriptions and everything. That's a, that's a great site. And uh, to find out more about your plants, uh, Yukon has a plant database, which is quite good and geared to this region. And uh, Doug Tallamy has created uh, with the National Wildlife Federation, a native plant finder also by region. Prairie Moon is, is a, um, a mail order, but uh, they have a great blog uh, with a lot, a lot of advice on growing natives and they have great germination instructions. And if you pick a plant in particular, it shows you what its, what its range is, what its native range is, just, just a great, great resource. And Kim Ironman is a local expert. I'm taking a, a class with her right now at New York Botanical Garden. And uh, she also collaborated with uh, Aspatuck Land Trust on their uh, native plant offerings. And her uh, website uh, is full of information as well. So check those out and you'll get lots and lots of ideas. So mapping your choices. This is the last step in planning and it's an important step. And I've included two examples of sketches here to show what you can do. This is really good because it helps you figure out how many plants you actually have to buy. So it's really good to do this before uh, you buy your plants. And um, color keys help. So break out the colored pencils or markers. And uh, you'll. Ch this looks like a hot mess, but it's actually a pretty carefully done plan. And you'll notice there's three lists. This group is the ones that bloom early. This group is the one that, ones that bloom in the middle of the season, and these are the ones that bloom late. So this is the list of plants that were chosen grouped by that, and it makes it really easy to sort of scatter them around the plan to say, okay, so I'm going to take how many from this list, spread them out, now I'm going to sprinkle in the ones from the middle bloomers and the ones from the late bloomers so that you don't have dead spots in your bed as you go. So You've calculated the plants you need this way. You just go back through and say, ooh, um, gosh, I was gonna buy too many Joe Pie and then you know, I've got to allow three feet for them. So I, I don't need as many as I thought I was gonna buy. So that's good. You, uh, um, plugs, Aspect Land Trust is selling plugs. Um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, native plant uh, sales offer plugs. They're, they're smaller than container plants that you typically buy from a local nursery. And so they take a little longer to fill in, but they do fill in. They've got a decent amount of roots on them and some of them will fill in really well in, in year one. Uh, but uh, I like to use a mix of when I'm doing a new garden for somebody, I buy container grown plants from local uh, uh, nurseries and plugs and mix them together because then I get more bang for my buck, but I also get uh, some things that are filling in faster right away so that I get a sense of, of the look of the garden from the first year forth. Now you can, when you mail order plants, bear in mind that because of shipping costs and everything, you're always going to get a smaller plant for your money than you do if you shop at a local nursery. So um, that's a bit of a trade-off. If you're something that's really special that you're trying to track down, it might be worth ordering it, but I like to go and pick out my plants myself because that way I know I'm getting uh, nice, big, healthy plants. Okay, guess what? It's finally time to go shopping. And uh, this is the end of my, my talk today, and I'm excited to answer any questions you have. And uh, I'll uh, see you at the nursery and see you in the garden. So Amanda, do we have it? Looked like I thought.
thought we I do thought have a few more questions. I was slow with the deer, so I didn't I didn't want to distract after sure. you're done. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this. Is it, is it Bobex or Bobex? Is it a Bobex. good anti-deer product? Uh huh. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, I I'm check the label, make sure that there's uh, that it's organic, but I believe it is. And uh, a lot of times you have to switch off between a couple different products or use them in combination, keep the deer guessing. So uh, and then someone has, um, is it hosta? And the deer okay. is very attracted to it, but she doesn't want to get rid of the hosta. So what is another suggestion, a workaround? Well, a fence. Uh, it, it, people, uh, we gardeners call hosta the deer salad bar. <laughs> uh, and, and some people actually use it as a trap crop to keep the deer away from their other stuff. I mean, and, and, and it is a great shade plant. I uh, used to have some of it in my own yard before the deer ate it all, and I just gave up. It is not native. Um, so it, I understand it is a great plant, uh, and it may have a place in your garden. Uh, maybe you have a fenced area, but unless you want to be spraying it constantly, um, it's going to get eaten. Sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings, but it is the, seems to be the favorite deer food around mm. here. Good to know. Do you have any suggestions for shadier areas around four hours of sun? Um, yes. Well, the the flowers on my on the list uh, for the part shade, four hours considered is considered part shade, and that's uh, all of those are uh, natives well suited for part shade. And um, uh, if you uh, look up, let's see, what am I? What am I putting in my own? Uh, uh, what else have I found? So uh, uh, geranium uh, there uh, that that is uh, Cranesbill is is really good. Uh, there are some of the uh, the the mountain mints uh, are very good, and in in general, anything that's a mint, the deer won't eat. Um, in 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 full shade. Uh, the, there are, uh, um, uh, there's something called, uh, Galteria procumbens, which is winter green is the common name. And, uh, it's, it's low growing and it's kind of evergreen and, uh, it has a cute little red berry on it. And it's actually, uh, tastes like winter green gum because that's the ingredient. And it's, it's, uh, a good deer resistant shade plant and, uh, sedges, are grasses like sun, sedges are shade lovers and they look just like grasses. And sedges tend to be something that the deer uh, ignore. And um, so uh, they're called carex. And uh, in the picture that's on, uh, still on your screen, um, that is uh, from, uh, uh, that was taken at Native LLC, uh, which is a, it's up on Reading Road in Fairfield. And um, they have, this is in their shade. That's their under their, everything that's in this picture is a shade plant. And other, other good shade uh, plants, uh, if you have deeper shade, our uh, maidenhair fern is beautiful and a native. Many, many ferns are native and deer resistant. And those make uh, really great choices. And they, um, uh, there is a, a hydrangea arborescence, which is our native hydrangea, is also pretty uh, shade tolerant, although uh, it can get hit by the deer occasionally, uh, not always. I've got it in my garden, but it can happen. And uh, um, so those are, those are a few choices. But if, if you uh, go to the sites that I've recommended on, on the handout, and uh, most of them have tools to help you search for plants that, that uh, will, will do well. Thank you. Are white pines and blue spruce valuable for the environment? Um, pines can be. Uh, spruce, it depends. We do have a native spruce. Uh, the blue spruce is mostly uh, from uh, Colorado, I believe. So, uh, Try to get the, the ones that are, are Eastern 
our, our northeastern uh, and and yes, they do they they add food. So so does hemlock uh, provide a, a good sources of food. So um, those those are things that you can consider. But in general, blue spruces tend to be from uh, the west rather than uh, the northeast. So Thank check you. check the specific variety you're looking at, and uh, you can just Google is is um, you know is the species is the a specific species native and they'll tell you. Someone wanted to know um, is Home Depot or Lowe's uh, you know how is it compared to a nursery? Um, there have been problems with them spraying neonicotinoids on their plants. Uh, they say they do not but but there are uh, instances of that. But one of the problems is that you don't get knowledgeable sales help. And many of the local nurseries, such as, uh, uh, let's see, it's the garden center. I, it's called Wright and Darien and then Copias and Gilberti's and Oliver's and Native, for example, are nurseries where if you go there, somebody knowledgeable will be there, knowledgeable about Natives, uh, in fact. And uh, you can, get really good information about the plants you're choosing and whether they're right for your site right there on the spot. And that is not going to happen at a Lowe's or a Home Depot. Uh, their plants are a lot of times grown in nurseries in other part of the country. They're not local grown and uh, they won't fare as well in our climatic conditions as plants that are sourced more locally too. And someone wants to know, uh, back to the hosta, this is from someone else. She um, says that she has a patch that is eaten every year and she's ready to concede the loss to the deer and plant something <laughs> else. Do you have any alternatives? Um, for, um, for alternatives for replacing hosta, uh, yes. I would, I would encourage um, uh, you to check out sedges because uh, there's something called... Uh, seersucker sedge. It's really kind of a cool plant. It's, it's got uh, a, a wavy leaf to it and uh, kind of like a, a, a sort of a broader shaped leaf. It's not, I mean, you know, the hospice have been hybridized for all those exotic colors um, and that may, um, you may not find that. Another thing that's, that's cool um, uh, besides the sedges and uh, is, is um, uh, some of the um, heuchera, uh, uh, heuchera is, is coral bells come, the leaves are very interesting and they come in all different colors. And uh, that's kind of a pretty, and they're pretty, uh, they, they take a, a part shade uh, exposure pretty well. And uh, that might be a cool thing to experiment with. So it'll give you the, the co interesting colors and texture that will make you happy. And uh, check out some of, some of the ferns. Ferns do real well any place that hosta, and, and there are some really cool ferns. You can get a glimpse of in the picture that's on the screen right now, uh, some of those ferns in the foreground. So it's, it, no, it's not exactly a hosta, but it'll do well in the spot where your hosta has been growing and uh, you, will, you can fall in love with all the different kinds of ferns instead. Hope that helps. Thank you. And someone wants to know, is rose milkweed coastal Joe, is it Joe pie? Is that how you pronounce it? Joe pie weed or New York ironweed invasive? Um, okay, so I, were, they just named three different plants, I think. I heard mm -hmm. Joe pie, uh, New York ironweed, and did they mention milkweed also? And rose milkweed, correct. Rose milkweed, okay. Rose milkweed is, um, is, is not invasive, it's clump growing. It is not one of the ones that sends runners all over your garden. So rose milkweed uh, called as, as Asclepius incarnata, uh, that's the one, or also known as swamp milkweed, that's a good one. Uh, will not, will not uh, uh, go crazy. It tolerates, it even tolerates a bit of shade, not a lot, but a bit of shade. Uh, the uh, New York ironweed and uh, the Joe pie, um, I don't consider them 
the Joe pie can spread a little bit, but uh, it's relatively easy to keep in check. It, it's not, you're not gonna say, oh my God, this thing is everywhere. So, um, so that's really fine. And the same with the ironweed. I haven't had a problem with those. Uh, I would say of the three, Joe pie is more likely to spread more, but uh, you, it's not that hard to uh, um, get rid of. If, if you see it coming up someplace you don't want, just yank it. Another question is what seeds are available in the library seed exchange? So currently we're restocking it, but we have all heirloom varieties, lots of vegetables, sadly no tomatoes. Um, it is not fully open yet to the public, but if you stop by and you're interested, um, ask for Susan Scarrett and she'll take a, uh, you know, let you take a look and help you out. Another question was, um, I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen this word. Um, what about Arbor Vita? Vita? Arbor, Arbor Vita, yes. Okay, thank yes. you. And is it native? Um, there are some that are native. Uh, now, the ubiquitous green giant is not native. It's actually uh, a, a clone of two deer uh, with red cedar. That's why the deer don't eat it. So that one's not native. Um, there are uh, the Thuja, which is Arbor Vitae. There are some that are native and they are not as deer resistant as some things are. I have some that hasn't been chewed in my yard because it's close to my doorway. And I guess the deer are a little nervous about eating right in front of my door. So that's where I have it. But it isn't, it wouldn't be my first choice for deer resistance. If you're looking for a screening plant, mainly people use Arbor Vitae for screening plants. Uh, a good native screening plant is, is hemlock or uh, white, pine if, pine, white pine if you've got the sunlight, uh, hemlock if you don't have quite so much sunlight are, are good choices. Thank you. And that's it for our questions. And we just had a few thank yous. Oh, we have someone said, would you mind repeating um, what you mentioned earlier on regarding cayenne pepper. Oh, yes. Um, so we've had modest success with uh, uh, keeping chipmunks and uh, sometimes even woodchucks and rabbits away by using cayenne. And uh, I buy it by the giant bag uh, at uh, the Indian uh, grocery store that's close to Best Buy in Norwalk on the Post Road. Um, I think it's Patel Brothers. And so you can get this, it, rather than a little spice jar bottle of it, you've got a big bag of cayenne pepper. So it, it, uh, it lasts longer and I sprinkle it around uh, at the base of plants that they've been coming near. Uh, there's a home remedy that you can Google that involves garlic and cayenne pepper making kind of a slurry, uh, but I tend to be, I find it easier to just go out and sprinkle the cayenne pepper around. It's, it's organic, it really can't hurt anything. And you know, if you're, you've got a curious dog, he's gonna get a surprise, but it can't hurt anything. <laughs> I'm gonna share the link for the grocery store in the chat. Oh, thank you. I don't need to stock up now. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Patel Brothers is going to be saying, man, a lot of people <laughs> oh, buying. Who's, who's buying all this cayenne? <laughs> thank you so much, Alice. This has been wonderful. I'm excited to get started. Um, I know in the morning now I've been hearing the birds chirping. So the spring is just around the corner. Yeah, yeah, that's a great sound to hear. So good luck, everybody, with your gardening and see you in the garden. And you'll